Hey everyone, Devin here. In my last video, I talked a little bit about how to do form validation, but I only kind of gave you two pieces of the puzzle. I didn't really give you the entire picture. In this video, I'm going to fill in the gap and show you how to do event-driven programming on the front end in JavaScript so that you can actually do real-life form validation. One quick note before we jump in. This is front-end validation, which is really important. It's great for your user's experience, but it's not everything. It's not the only thing you need in terms of validation. If you really want to do validation right, you're going to need validation on your back-end too, because front-end validation can easily be circumvented. So if you're trying to keep garbage data out of your database or wherever you're storing this data you're getting, you need to have validation on the back end. Then you can layer on your front end validation just to let the user know more quickly that there's a problem. Let's go to the computer. We're going to work on this in CodePen. That is a web-based IDE. That's what you're looking at here on my screen right now. I've created a simple form to get started, and then I added a really basic CSS framework just to make things look a little bit nicer by default. I will add a form to the page for this video that you can enter your email address and you'll get a link to this starter, and you'll also get a link to the finished project so that you can look at that if you want to. Once you have that link for this starter project, you can just hit this fork button in the bottom right. And that will create a new copy of this starter for you in your CodePen account. I'm going to go ahead and rename mine since this will be the completed pen that you'll also get a copy of. Before I start writing any custom validation, I want to show you a way that you might not have to write any custom form validation. And this is what you should do if the browser's built-in validation is sufficient for your needs. I've pulled up the MDN article on the input element. Most of your form controls will be input elements. This article has a handy reference of all the different input elements you can use. You can see here is a date. And a lot of these will enforce various types of formats. So if I go to either this month or the date or the year and try to type in like an alphabetic character, it's just going to swallow that input and that never actually goes into the, the input element. This email input is a really useful one. If I type something in here that's not an email, it will let me do that, but it won't let me submit the form at this point. I can't really demonstrate that here, but you can see if I hover over it, it's giving me a tooltip in Chrome that says to include an at sign. This number input is also a useful one. Just like the date input we tested before, this one will swallow alphabetic characters. I'm pressing keys now. Oh, it will let me press an E. I suppose that's for scientific notation, but other alphabetic characters it will not take. I can enter numbers though. I also get this. And if you're on a mobile device with this number input, you'll get the number keypad instead of the full keyboard when you enter into this input. URL is another one that is pretty useful. And you can click through on any one of these to get some more information about that input type. Here's how you would actually use it. You use input, and then you add a type attribute, and then as a string, whichever type you want to use for that input. The input value is automatically validated to ensure that it's either empty or a properly formatted URL before the form can be submitted. This is free validation you get that's just included with the browser. 
lean on this as much as you possibly can so that you don't have to write it yourself. You might have also noticed in their example they're using a pattern attribute. If you scroll down here, that is listed under supported common attributes. That means you can use this in a lot of input elements regardless of the type. This lets you give the input element a regular expression that is used to validate the input. That's also going to take care of a lot of your validation needs and save you from writing a lot of JavaScript. As you're exploring these other input types, you can check and see if they support that. For instance, the text is sort of the most generic text input. It doesn't really have any built-in validation, but it does support the pattern attribute. So if you want to give that a custom regular expression pattern to validate, you can definitely do that. I'm already using one of the special input types. I'm using the email input. If I go down to my email field and type something that's not an email, then I should get that same tooltip. Yeah, it says please include an at sign in the email address. And this would prevent the form from being submitted if I actually had a submit button and if the form submitted to somewhere. Let's imagine I wanted to implement some really naive validation on the name field, and I wanted to make sure that it has a space in it. This is probably not a good validation you'd want to use in practice, because I'm sure there are cases where a valid name might not have a space in it, but we'll do it here for the purposes of demonstration. I could use the pattern attribute to do this so that I don't have to write JavaScript. And to do that, I'm just going to try to write an expression that will work. I think what this will do is allow any number of characters a space and then any number of characters. Let's type something that's not that and see if it gives us. Yeah, now we're getting a tool tab that says, please match the requested format. The browser knows that this doesn't match the pattern that the developer has inputted for this element. Let's go ahead and match that. And now we're not getting any sort of tooltip. So this is valid against the pattern. I can get as fancy as I want here with the regular expressions. And those can get you pretty far, which is why I say that if you use those, you may not have to write any JavaScript. Here's a case though where you would need JavaScript. Let's say I want to accept email addresses from two different domains. I want to accept them from raddevin.com and from radworks.io. That alone probably is not enough to go beyond the pattern matching. You can probably still write a regular expression to match that. But here's the kicker. I know that email addresses at raddevin.com have a dot in the first part of the email address. So it's like a name, dot, and then a last name, and that's the pattern that they all follow. So I only want to accept them if they match that pattern. But for email addresses at radworks.io, those are all a name underscore and then a name. So first name underscore last name. That's probably something I could get to with a, a nasty regular expression, but I'm just going to write that in JavaScript instead. The first thing I need to do is I need to figure out what user interaction I'm going to hook into to do this validation. When do I want to validate the user's input? I could validate it every time they press a key in one of the fields. That tends to get a little messy if you don't do it right if you're not attentive to how you're how you're doing that validation. So I think I prefer to validate on a submission. And I realize that I don't actually have a submit button yet, so I'm going to go ahead and add that. This will already be added on your starter. Okay, there's our submit button. 
that's what I'm going to hook into in order to validate. I need to first query the DOM for that submit button. If you don't know how to do that, go back and check out the DOM manipulation series. I'll put a link to the first video in the series up in the corner of this video so you can check it out. I'll just name this submit button. And I'm just going to query for a button element. That's the only one, so that should be fine. And while we're here, I'm going to resize this. I'm not going to be messing with any CSS, so I just uh, want as much room as possible for my JavaScript. OK, now I have the button in JavaScript, so I can start to tinker with that. What I want to do with it, and this is the event-driven programming part of this lesson, I'm going to add an event listener. This is a method of a DOM element. I've pulled up the article in MDN so you can see how this works. It uses one of these three signatures. For the purposes of this demo, we're just going to be using these first two arguments, the type and the listener, and we won't be using any of the other optional arguments. If we keep scrolling, MDN tells us that the type parameter is a case-sensitive string representing the event type to listen for. An event type is linked here, so I'm going to click through to that. And that's going to show me a list of some of the events that I can hook into. I'm just going to scroll through this list and browse for something that looks interesting. And actually, the submit looks pretty interesting, but that is a form event. I am looking at a button. Down here in mouse events, there is a click event. A pointing device button has been pressed and released on an element. That is what I want here if I'm going to hook into the button. So I need to pass that type as a string. That is the first argument to add event listener. The second argument is the listener. MDN tells me that is the object that receives a notification when an event of the specified type occurs. This must be an object implementing the event listener interface or a JavaScript function. I will just show you what that looks like in practice. If you pass a function as this listener argument, JavaScript will call that function when the event triggers, and it'll pass in an event argument that tells more information about what event actually occurred. I'm just going to use an arrow function here. Now I'm writing a function that's going to run every time the submit button is clicked. What I want to do is I want to look at the value of the email field. In order to do that, I need to query the DOM again to get access to that email field in JavaScript. I'm going to use an attribute selector, and I will grab it by the name attribute with the value of email. Since that name attribute with that value is unique to this field. I know this will always give me only that field I want to look at. I'm going to go ahead and create another variable that will just be the value of that email field. One quick optimization I can do here. This field is never going to change, so I don't really need to grab it on each click. I can just move this outside of my event listener and grab it before anything happens. That's always going to be the same, so I only need to get that once. The value that's in the field will potentially be different on every click of that submit button, so I want to get that anew every time. Now from here on in, I'm really just writing whatever JavaScript I need to do this validation. The first step of the validation is going to be to figure out what domain the email address is in. So that means that I need to be able to separate the email address into 
the first part of the email address and the domain. I know those are always separated by an at sign, so I can use that to split the string. I'm going to call the first part username for lack of a better term. And the second part will be domain. And to split, I will call this split method on the email string, which should just be whatever the user has entered in that email field. Then I need to pass split the string I want to split on, which is just going to be an at sign. And I've forgotten that I need to wrap these in square braces in order to do that destructuring assignment. What that will do is that will create two variables this is going to be an array. That's going to return an array. So JavaScript will unpack that array and the first value will become the username variable. The second value will become the domain. At this point, I can just use an if statement to check the domain. And then it should be either raddevin.com or it should be radworks.io. If it's not that, then we have a problem. This condition will tell me if the domain is raddevin.com, but I really also want to know if it's that domain and if the first part of the email address, which we're calling the username here, does not have a dot. I could put all that into this if statement, but it's kind of messy and hard to read. So instead, I'm going to make a variable. I'm going to call it is valid rad devin email, and that's going to be domain equals raddevin.com, so the condition we already have there. And then it's going to be ended with username.includes. It should include a dot. That means this variable will either be true or false, depending on whether both of these are true. Now we'll just make another one of these for is valid radworks email. That one's going to be domain equals radworks.io and username.includes and this one has an underscore. Now we have the two conditions that we want to test for. That's going to let me simplify this if statement to because really what I want to do is, if neither of these is true, then I want to stop submission of this form. I don't want to allow it to go off to the server. So really it's just going to be one condition now, and that condition is not is valid red devon email, and not is valid radworks email. This effectively says if neither of these are true, if it's not a valid raddevin email and if it's not a valid radworks email, then I want to stop everything. I want to put on the brakes. In order to do that, I need the event object. So I'm going to go ahead and name that parameter event so that I have access to the event that's going to be passed into this function. And I'm calling a method of that event, which is prevent default. That stops the default browser behavior that happens when you click on the submit button in the form, which is to submit the form to send it off to the server. Generally, you would have an action attribute on your form that would tell the form where it needs to submit the data to. And with prevent default, that would not happen. What you would probably want to do here, and I'm not going to do it in this demo, but you'd want to do something that shows the user what's wrong. So maybe you have an alert box at the top of your form that you could now reveal. 
and show to the user. And you could put some text in it that says your email address must be a valid raddevin.com or radworks.io email address. But you need to give them something to go on. If you just don't submit the form and don't tell the user why, they don't really know what to do next. That's what happens if it's not a valid raddevin or radworks email. Otherwise, the form gets submitted and everything goes off just like it would have otherwise. So that is really the extent of this form validation. A couple of optimizations you could make. When we were looking through the event types earlier, we saw that form submit, which looked interesting, but we weren't actually working with the form. We were working with the button instead. This is going to be better for form validation. And here's why. You may have users that fill out this form and then maybe once they finish entering their email, they press the return key or the enter key on their keyboard. That's going to trigger a form submission, but it does not trigger this click event on the button because the button was never clicked. If you, instead of doing this, grab the form, you can add an event listener for the submit event. That triggers any time the form is submitted through any means. So that means if I click the submit button, it fires this submit event on the form and our event listener will execute. If I enter my details and then press return in one of the fields, any method the user uses to submit this form is going to trigger this event so each of those submissions are going to be piped through this event listener, and they're all going to be subjected to our validation. Here's what I'm going to do just as a quick and dirty way to show how this works. I'm going to use the alert function to just pop up a box and tell the user that um, your email is invalid. That way we can just demonstrate that this does work. I'll go ahead and type in my name. And then this is actually my email address. Based on our validation parameters, this should not work. Oh, <laughs> the name won't work either because we haven't matched the pattern we used earlier. And that was actually a good demo. You could see what the browser does when one of those built-in validations is not satisfied. Okay, we got the alert. Your email is invalid. And now the submission does not go through. If we enter a valid email address, valid by the definition of this application, which would be devon.campbell, this should allow for submission. That's not actually going to do anything here. It's probably just going to refresh this page, but at least we won't see the alert. Before I do this, I'm going to save just so I don't lose anything. Okay. Oh, okay. That um, blanked out all my inputs. Let's try again. Okay. This should be valid. All right, That's, uh, this is somewhat unexpected, but it did submit. We didn't get the alert. We should get the same results if we submit a valid Radworks email address. Let's test that. It did submit. And let's enter, just, uh, just for kicks here, let's enter an invalid Radworks email address. And there we get our alert again. Your email is invalid. That was form validation in JavaScript. In general, you want to do as little of your own custom form validation as possible, but there are occasions when the built in browser validation just doesn't cut it, and this is what you do in cases like those. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.